Welcome to another episode of Resetology, where conversations revolve around changing from the inside out. I'm here today with Jeff and Julie to talk about the dangers of rigid thinking. When someone has an inflexible and stubborn thinking style, it can feel like conversations and even your whole relationship is running into an invisible concrete wall. It doesn't matter if the topic is politics or religion or a personal or family matter that people have different viewpoints on. When there's rigid thinking, there is no flexibility. And that's because rigid thinking is the opposite of being open-minded and empathetic. When someone is a rigid thinker, Their unmet expectations lead to frustration and often confrontation. It's human nature to be frustrated when life doesn't go according to plan, but what distinguishes flexible thinkers from rigid thinkers is that flexible thinkers have the ability to find a point of connection, appreciate other viewpoints, and try new things. These are all life skills that are tremendously helpful for maintaining healthy relationships. So we're gonna dive into this topic through the lens of John chapter eight which is one of many interactions that Jesus has with religious leaders who cannot and will not open up their minds and hearts to the possibility that he's the Messiah, despite the signs and wonders, despite his authoritative teaching, their rigid way of thinking prevents them from seeing the one that they have been anticipating their entire lives. What do you guys think? The dangers of rigid thinking. It's the perfect title of a message to forward to a friend. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, and, and if you're the person who thinks you need to forward it to a friend, then you're also the person who needs to listen to it. <laughs> yes. So, Jeff, take just a moment and explain to us what's happening in John chapter 8. This podcast is really coming out of some light bulb moments that we had in one of our life groups. We've been going through the Gospel of John, and when we were discussing John 8, we began to notice this concept of rigid thinking. But tell us what's happening in John 7. Give us some context for John 8. Yeah, it's they're living with a lot of circumstances that are a lot more similar to ours in the 21st century West than than we might think. There's a huge clashing of values. I know in America, we've never experienced, especially in our lifetime, living under an occupying power, but they're living under an occupying power who's crippling them with taxes. It's, you know, common knowledge for, for New Testament geeks. And um, but there's also a clash in value system. The occupying power has a completely different value system than our, our people in these passages. And you're, if you're living in this context, your, your culture was kind of taken over for the last 300 years by these other value systems and these mm-hmm. other religions and these other, this, this, this totally other way of doing things. And I think that a lot of people who oftentimes, especially in Christian circles, get vilified are people that are far easier to identify with than, than we realize. And when we stop and we give them a chance because they're, they're living in a society where things aren't clear anymore and things are chaotic. Value systems converge and they, a lot of them retreat to what's safe hmm. and they retreat to these intellectual structures, these, these ideologies where they feel that there's safety. So um, one of the mysteries of the New Testament is why it was so difficult for the leadership and others to recognize Jesus as a Messiah. I mean, it's it seems obvious in retrospect, um, looking at all the signs and wonders he did and things he said, but they pushed him away. And we often do the same thing when God is trying to reach us. That's where the rigid thinking comes in. Yeah, and what's interesting here is you have a group of people who have committed their entire lives to upholding their culture and upholding their religious traditions, but they're living in a time where those things which are closest to their hearts are being deeply threatened. So it seems like their spiritual antennas should be way up because the time is ripe for Messiah But yet their religious convictions actually seem to be getting in the way. And really what it is, is is that rigid thinking of who the Messiah would be and what he would do. It's okay to have convictions, but when those convictions rob us of our ability to empathize with people, then we have a problem. And then we can end up being very much like, you know, these, these guys called the Pharisees that we talk about in here, you know, Jewish leadership who have a very clear theology and a very clear understanding of who and what God is. And Jesus shows up and he continually, as God in the flesh, doesn't meet those expectations. And because they're stuck in this rigid, these rigid thinking patterns, 
they can't empathize not just with Jesus, but they can't empathize, as we see repeatedly in John, with people he heals. You know, the, the handicapped man at Bethesda, the, the blind man near Siloam, and it just all disintegrates. Yeah, I, I would imagine that they would be fighting cynicism and despair or feeling like God didn't see them. Um, and the, the religious leaders were spiritual leaders trying to navigate a world that really wasn't cooperating with them. All of the things that they had been formed to do, they really weren't, they really weren't free. They had some protections, um, but it was, it was limited freedom. Um, and they really weren't living the way that they saw earlier in scriptures that their people have been able to live. So I think in times like that, we, we try to forge our way through. Um, we try to just see what works. I was, I was saying how, you know, this past week was, has been a little bit stressful for me because of some reorganization at work and how happy it makes me just to open up my Bible app and see that I'm on track with my Bible reading plan. Like at least I can control this, Mm -hmm. right? At least I can control here. Mm -hmm. Um, and you kind of cling to the things that you can control when there's so much that you can't control. And so when we go into John chapter eight, it's really full of dialogue and this collision of expectations and disillusionment, and there's just fireworks going off. So Jeff, why don't you read for us a portion of John chapter eight? Verses 12 to 20, Jesus spoke again to the people. He said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him, here you are, appearing as your own witness, your testimony is not valid. And Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards, I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. And they asked him, where is your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one sees them because his hour had not yet come. One window into the rigid thinking that we see here is when they ask him, where is your father? Their their way of doing things that... They, again, this is where it gets very tricky for Christians. They're asking Jesus where his father is because this is a converse, this is a conversation about testimony and what makes a person's testimony valid. So they need someone to testify on his behalf since he's mm. making these claims. So that's why they say, where's your father? It's the same reason in, in the next chapter when they bring in the blind man's parents because they need witnesses for, for his case. So... They're not doing something terrible by saying, who's your father? They're trying to give Jesus a fair hearing here. But the problem is also that they've taken teaching of God, and I guess we're so tricky for Christians, and they get so rigid with it. They can't look at the merciful acts that Jesus does and the merciful teachings that he provides and see the character of God in it because they're so focused on this is going to sound terrible, the Bible. (laughs) Mm. We love the Bible and we spend hours in the Bible every week here at Reset. It's such a thin line to walk between having the right theology, but also being willing to hold a lot of things loosely because God has this knack for never meeting our expectations. Mm -hmm. And that's why so many people struggled to believe in him in the New Testament because he wasn't meeting their expectations and their expectations existed in this little fortress of mental rigidity. And he's kind of poking the bear here with some of the comments and the things that he's saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in his dialogue, he's actually highlighting some of the ways that they're resisting God. He's highlighting some of the prejudices that they have, the misconceptions that they have, and their way of thinking just in the things that he's saying. He knows that their hearts are going to be revealed with their own resistance. It's like that passage of scripture that says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So as they start talking, it's just what you said. It's revealing what's Mm -hmm. inside of their hearts. And we're all prone to that. Yeah. Right? So how do we do the same thing? 
Oh, we totally do the same thing. I, I mentioned that just this week, you know, we there was some reorganization at work and I'm noticing myself so hypersensitive to mm-hmm. any comments people make about my work or about my role. Just in passing, things that probably would not normally bother me, it, they're, it's extra sensitive because I feel like I'm on the defense, right? So though that's, you know, we all go through those little challenges and we recognize that if we turn that inward, if we if we look in the mirror and we recognize, wow, that that really hurt. That really provoked me in a way that's not that's out of proportion mm-hmm. to what the person intended. Those are really good clues that there are places that we need to dig in a little bit more and say, wow, why did I push back so much? Why did I feel defensive in that moment? What what are the things that are in my heart or the ways that I'm being rigid? Yeah, I think those are key characteristics of being rigid. And the thing is, when, once we learn about mental rigidity, we can spot it. We tend to spot it in other people. Mm-hmm. And hopefully we spot it in ourselves first. It's those people who just who um, can't accept other people's viewpoints mm. and they can't demonstrate empathy. You're like, you are totally operating and that your own little mental fortress and it's mm-hmm. impenetrable to other people and their ideas but you also, we also lock ourselves in there. Mm-hmm. You know, when we do that, we isolate ourselves. We lose the empathy. And when we lose empathy, there's just a catastrophic fallout from the loss of our ability to empathize with people. We can't have relationships with people if we can't empathize. And I'm thinking so much as we're talking here about the concept of safe people. We just did a session on this at our Reset Together program last week. We talked about what is a safe person? When I say safe person, I mean emotionally safe person. And so people say things like, well, it's effortless to be around a safe person. It feels authentic. It feels vulnerable. The word empathy comes up, which is what Jeff, you just mentioned. But then the contrast, we talk about what does it feel like to be around an unsafe person? And we talk about how Unsafe people don't like to admit weaknesses. They don't like to admit mistakes. They're afraid of vulnerability. I mean, it's really the flip of everything that's safe, but nothing from the outside can get in, which results in not being able to grow. Yeah, it's it's so interesting that Jesus came at the time that, that he chose to come. And there are a plethora of reasons, a whole constellation of reasons, but maybe one of those reasons is because his people had been under occupation by by the Greeks before the Romans, a completely different value set, and then the Romans, still a completely different value set from their own. And there were a lot of people, especially in leadership, who are on edge, and I think in a sense their heart's in the right place because they want to protect and preserve their theology and 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 their monotheism and their belief in, in the one true God amidst these outside theologies and outside spiritualities that have come into play. And I think a lot of us in the modern world, especially the modern Western world, can relate to that. Like we want to hold our theology very, very firmly in the midst of of some pretty thick pluralism. And that's good on one hand, but on the other hand, it's so easy to mix some stuff into our quote-unquote theology that isn't actually very theological. And it's Mm. much more, we're trying to protect where we stand in society. We're trying to protect our personal values. We're trying to protect certain cultural values. But so were were these guys Mm -hmm, in the Jewish mm -hmm. leadership. They're trying to protect the pillars of society, and they end up completely missing Jesus. I have so much compassion often, maybe that's not the right word, but at the very least empathy mm-hmm. for the religious leadership here. And they, they get slammed in Christianity. And I think unfairly, because I think anybody, any, any of us Christians who want to slam them, we need to set that aside for a moment and empathize with them and look at the world that they're in. All these outside forces, and they're trying to keep people faithful to the God who has rescued them time and time again and established a covenant with them. And they're trying to keep people faithful to that covenant and to God's teaching, um, and Jesus comes along, and he's just not fitting this mental mold yeah. that they had created, and so they miss him. But a good question to, for us to ask ourselves as Christians, like, are we creating mental molds that are so rigid mm. that if God were to show up, mm-hmm. would we miss him too? Mm-hmm. And there's this is such a great topic because there's so much we can explore with regards to, like, you know, the draw towards authoritarian leadership, you know, Mm -hmm. and populist politics, because they really appeal to certain things that we value or people who see the world they know slipping away. 
and they want to try to grasp at it mm -hmm. when at the end of the day it's the kingdom of god that is eternal and remains this world changes but the kingdom of god remains and our, yeah. our faith and what we're called to do in christ remains the same yeah absolutely and it's so hard to walk um, to walk in that that flexibility and receptiveness to God when we feel like there's a pull towards chaos in society. We want to yank the other direction towards rigidity, um, whether it's in, in our own lives with circumstances or whether it's in our culture that we want to like pull the reins back and control what we can to the point that it takes on a life of its own, right? And can become a kind of syncretism or idolatry in, you know, however that plays out, again, whether individually or as a culture. I love this verse in John 8, 47. Jesus makes this statement and it's so powerful. He says, whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is you do not belong to God. What's so striking to me in this, in this passage, and it's really in so much of the New Testament, is the contrast between natural sight and hearing mm. and spiritual sight and hearing. Because here mm -hmm. you literally have the Son of God in front of them, and they can't see him, and they're not hearing him, spiritually speaking. Naturally, mm -hmm. they are. It begs the question, why, why couldn't they see and hear him spiritually? And when I read a passage like this, a couple things come to mind. One is you hear that phrase, nothing blinds like pride. Hmm. And it's so true. There's like a spiritual pride in their heritage, in their culture, in what they know, you know, versus what he knows. And it's like, they're going to argue him into their way of thinking. But then also judgments blind us. And Jesus talks about that in other places, the whole plank in your eye, speck in someone yeah. else's eye, that when we make judgments against people, it blinds us, you know, and they've certainly judged him and they just can't see. So that pride and that judgment, it blinds us. And we're all prone to that. Yeah. You know, our pride blinds us spiritually. And when we make judgments about God, about people, about ourselves, that blinds us to truth as well. Yeah. In verse 31, you know, this happening in civil courts, it's a place for public dialogue. And there's a crowd that's there listening to Jesus's debate with the Pharisees. And then some of them believe him and they start talking to him. And those are the very people that just a few verses down the page try to execute him. Mm. Mob violence. Mm -hmm. Because his conversation with them goes even worse than his conversation with the Pharisees. The Gospel of John is so interesting in this because of the way John paints Jesus. It's kind of, it's honestly kind of hard to communicate with Jesus in the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if, if, you are, if you are on those pages, you're struggling to hear Jesus. Yeah. And yet... Jesus did say in John 8, 47, that those who belong to God can hear God's voice. And so the question then is, what does it mean to belong to God? Mm. Yeah, I think especially in the context we're working with here, I think it's, it's having your core and holding on to that tightly, but holding everything else very loosely. He even says at one point, he says, you belong to the devil. Yeah, talk it's about before, poking the bear. <laughs> yeah, and it's before he says this. And one of the things that jumps out to me is scripture says, even the demons believe. Mm. Belonging, it's different. It's being part of God's family. And I think the transition also is people who belong, obey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the difference really between Christians and, and the demons, right? If yeah. you, we believe in God, but they didn't obey him. Mm -hmm. Christians believe, but they also obey. And if we were to skip ahead to John 15, when Jesus is giving this long discourse before he leaves for heaven, he keeps saying, if you love me, you'll obey. If you love me, you'll obey. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said for the security in that. Mm -hmm. Because you're not going to obey unless you feel secure. And you, you're not going to feel secure unless you feel like you belong in his arms, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's he's got you. You belong to him. When we were um, training our dog behaviorist, who's fantastic, said, try feeding your dog from your hand so that he learns to trust you. Mm -hmm. And so that when you're out and he's triggered, you can give him commands and he'll trust you. He won't feel like he has to go it alone or, you know, be defensive, that you're not going to protect him. Mm -hmm. He needs to trust you that you're going to protect him. And feeding him with your hand is one way to create that connection with him. And I think 
I just see God's heart in that. And I think that's where God wants us to be, not like a reactive dog on on a leash feeling like we need to, you know, bark at everything, mm-hmm. right? But that we can walk in trust with our master that he's he cares for us. He's the one that feeds us. He's the one that gives us a home where we belong. And so we can relax and we can let down some of those some of that rigidity, some of those defenses that would cause us to really overprotect ourselves. I think that's a good ending spot for today. If you'd like to join a life group, we're continuing to go through the Gospel of John. Our co-ed groups meet on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. and Saturdays at 6 p.m. And then we also have a women's group on Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. If you're in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to check us out. You can learn more information on our website. In the meantime, if you could take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast, that helps us get these messages out to a larger audience. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to sharing with you next time. Thank you for listening. We hope this message encouraged you. For additional resources or information on our upcoming events, head to resetministries.us. That's resetministries.us.